Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our seventh When We See Us webinar series titled No Black Woman Can Write Too Much After Bell Hooks. The webinar series is conceived in collaboration with the Institute for Humanities in Africa, UMA, at the University of Cape Town, UCT, and is a parallel discursive program which provides theoretical framings for the When We See Us, A Century of Black Figuration in Painting exhibition. This exhibition held at Zeitzmarker runs into the 3rd of September. When We See Us explores Black self-representation and celebrates global Black subjectivities and Black consciousness from Pan-African and Pan-Diasporic perspective, it boldly brings together artworks from the last 100 years by Black artists working globally into dialogue with leading Black thinkers, writers, poets who are active today. Our esteemed guests for today's session include Eurekis Espinosa Minoso, Pumla Dineo Tola, Kudzanai Violet Wami, and our moderator is Susanna Souza. Eurekis Espinosa Minosa, Minoso is an Afro Caribbean theoretician, researcher, teacher, and popular educator. One of the precursors and main exponents of anti racist and decolonial feminism in Latin America and the Caribbean. She's a founding member of the Latin American Group for Feminist Studies, Training in Action, GLEFAS, and is the director of the GLEFAS Caribbean Institute of Decolonial Instituto Thought Caribeño and Research. De Pensamiento e Investigación. A frequent de... guest she's a frequent guest speaker at universities, organizations, and social movements in Latin America, the United States, and Europe. In 2021, she obtained a scholarship from the Kate Hamburger Center for the Acopolytic and post acopolytic Studies for a research stay at the University of Heidelberg. Her texts have been translated into English, German, Portuguese, French, and Italian. She is currently the curator of the research and exhibition project, Cimarron Anti-Futurism, an exhibition with 60 native and African diaspora artists in Abia Yala. Pumla Dineo Tola is a feminist writer and professor of literary and cultural studies. She holds the Saatchi Chair in African Feminist Imagination at Nelson Mandela University Center for Women and Gender Studies. She has been professor in the School of Literature, Languages and Media at the University of Witwatersrand, Fitz, senior lecturer in the Department of English at the University of the Free State, and Chief Research Specialist in Society, Culture, and Identities at the Human Sciences Research Council. In addition to numerous journal articles and book chapters, her seven books include the pioneering study, What is Slavery to Me? Post-Colonial and Slave Memory, Memory in Post-Apartheid South Africa, published by the Witz Press in 2010. The 2016 Alan Payton Award winner, Rape, a South African Nightmare, and the 2022 Humanities and Social Sciences Best Nonfiction Book, Female Fear Factory. Kudzanai Violet Wami currently lives and works in the United Kingdom and was born in Gutu, Zimbabwe in 1993. In 2016, the same year she graduated from the Wimbledon College of Arts with a Bachelor of Fine Arts, she was awarded the Clyde & Co Award and the Young Achiever of the Year Award at the Zimbabwean International Women's Awards, as well as being shortlisted for, for the Bloomberg New Contemporaries. In 2019, Wami presented work at the 58th Venice Biennial as part of the Zimbabwe Pavilion, the youngest artist to participate in the Biennale. In 2022, she returned to the 59th Venice Biennale as part of the Milk of Dreams curated by Cecilia Alemani, WAMI's first institutional solo exhibition, 15952 kilometers via Trans-Sahara Highway in one, was held at Gasworks London in 2019. Recent institutional exhibitions include a solo presentation at Kunsthaus Pascart, Switzerland, which was on view until 12 June in 2022. 
WAMI is part of our When We See Us, a century of Black figuration in painting at Zeitzmacher. WAMI's work is held in many public collections, including Government Art Collection, the High Museum of Art, Cadiz Foundation, Novel Foundation, Cedarlick Museum, the Tate, the Studio Museum in Harlem, to name a few. Susanna Souza is an independent curator, researcher, and writer. She's a PhD student at the History Department of the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, a fellow at the Center for Humanities Research and recipient of the Ivan Karp Research Award in 2022. She co-curated the exhibition, The Power of My Hands at the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, part of the Saison Africa 2020, currently being shown in Luanda, Angola at the National Museum for Natural History. Please note that part of today's webinar will be presented in Spanish. So be sure to look out for the English language option button during that section. I will now hand over to our moderator, Susana Souza. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the invitation, Tandazani, and I'm really happy to have uh, our guests. Um, and uh, um, I'll, I'll I'll just frame quickly the. Um, the, the the theme we'll be discussing will be talking about uh women's writing and we we're following the work of bell hooks to do that uh, uh in our panel you have a group of women that have been writing extensively about women's experiences uh particularly uh uh, women of color, women from diaspora, African women, black women, and uh, it makes total sense to use bell hooks in that context. Uh, the line we, we're using from bell hooks work is that no woman can write enough. And uh, what I think is important to note from that is that writing means to remove ourselves from the invisibility and uh, to share our experiences with the world. And for, as Black women, uh, that is historically important in the sense that our experiences, our uh, identities have been framed from the outside and have been framed by uh, colonial gaze, patriarchal gazes, and man, men's gazes. So to be able to write our own histories, our own experiences, means to take our own voice and to, and to decide how to frame, how to share our, our own experiences. As I said, I'm very happy to to listen to the women we have in the panel. I would like to start giving the floor to Professor Kumla Dineo Kola. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, <clears throat> Susanna, and thank you to Zaid Smolka for this invitation. Um, let me just get straight to it then. <clears throat> the invitation to speak this evening cites Bell Hooks's provocation. No black woman writer in this culture can write too much. Indeed, no woman writer can write too much. No woman has ever written enough. From Hooks's essay collection, Remembering Rapture, the artist at work. <clears throat> In that book, her 17th, Hooks sits with questions about the intersections of language, scale, and time that appear pertinent today as we think with the landmark exhibition, When We See Us, staging as it does, a vast repertoire of representational registers that Black artists of the African continent and its diaspora, what I like to call the African world, have brought to the invitation of painting figuratively. In Remembering Rapture, Hooks also spends considerable time thinking over many ways in which writing matters, 
Black women's writing matters and reflecting on Black women's writing's relationships to various archives, archives of writing, of imagination, of work, of thinking on and off the page. <clears throat> Painting, like writing, is a solitary meditative art, repetitive brush strokes like words, many restarts, changes in direction, discovery as the essay, because Hooks is particularly concerned here that black women do not write enough nonfiction. Discovery as the essay or painting takes a different direction than anticipated. She's also deeply invested in the pleasure of the writing process as work, as imagination, as world shifting, as open to productive misreading and the impossibility of access to much writing by a black woman. I'd like to bring a few other feminists to think with hooks here and to think with the exhibition when we see us. Paula Gunn Allen insists that women write into and out of a tradition. In other words, she's not interested in notions of the first. There is always a tradition, she reminds us. Therefore, a native woman, she says, but what I would also say a black woman writer enters a tradition. Hooks would insist that black women writers enter multiple traditions. These walk into the room ahead of the work she has produced. They are set and created in the reader or viewer or spectator ahead of their encounter with her writing. Such traditions range from those with expertise on black women, received knowledge, hegemonic ideas about who, what, where, and how black women are imaginable, their capacity for abstraction, their absence invoked over and over again. Therefore, as she writes, as the black woman, as a black woman writer writes, when we follow hooks, she writes into archives, which first make her writing an impossibility. Hegemonic lenses routinely brought to bear on making sense of African life and contemporary expressions, not only lead leading to misreading, but additional costs. And such costs as African feminist uh, Grace Musilla reminds us, such costs include, in addition to epistemic injustice, reliance on one dimensional knowledge registers that produce that produce blind spots and opacity resulting in inaccurate conclusions on the choices aesthetic and otherwise that africans make and the perspectives they hold as they do so we would do well to remember the fate of the first black woman to publish a book in english phyllis wheatley's 1773 poems on various subjects religious and moral, that her publication was met largely with disbelief. Yes, enslaved people were not supposed to read and write to know how. However, the disbelief is something that haunted her entire life. And this questioning, is she really the one who wrote them? Can she be believed? Can she be taken on her word? Is something that Mary Prince, publishing her slave narrative in 1831. So more than six decades later, and even though volumes of slave narratives had written in between, a question that she was still haunted by, as is clear by the accompanying testimonies to her first person account of her own life. Testimonies in addition to hers that testify to the veracity of her claims, her life, her authorship, of this project. When we think about the ways in which black women and black women writers are prefigured, we forget this enduring question that has haunted black women writers for centuries. So this is part of the archive that Hooks evokes, and this is part of the tradition, the archive that um, Paula Gunn Allen also evokes. When Miriam Tladi in South Africa finishes a novel between two worlds, which is published nearly a decade later in 1975, 
by a left press in South Africa as mural at Metropolitan, she is miserable. For the rest of her literary life, for the rest of her life, a prolific literary life with three more novels, numerous essays, two plays, dozens of short stories, micro histories, interviews with women pioneers, and more. She bemoans what was changed in the name of editing her first novel. Yet, until two years ago, the insistence by her publisher, her then publisher, that the manuscript was edited and not changed significantly is the one that receives circulation and acceptance um, and without access to her original manuscript, which had been banned, um, the original novel, which was also banned in South Africa, or the U United States and, and, and British editions, which were also banned in South Africa, the difference between the two texts remains unverified until recently. It is only when I looked at the two versions available for the first time recently in the last decade that I recognized that in fact, what Ladi had been saying without pause since 1975, that her book was significantly changed was valid. That the two novels, which were supposed to be two, the South African edition and um, a, a, a Global North edition were in fact completely different novels. So no editing. So when Hook says a black woman can never write enough, she also invites this archive of black women having to write again and again and again and receive treatment from critics and academics and general readers as though they are an anomaly, unreliable, unpredictable, not to be trusted with their own authority. This is part of the tradition they write into, a tradition that says they know the least about their lives and even less about their art forms. But, and this is where when we see us offers one of many powerful reminders, they also write into a tradition of many other black women who have written again and again. In her debut collection of poems, Ilifa Atambile Masola references and calls onto the page the feminist black women who have been writing in Isitosa for over a hundred years many of whom are only now again being remembered because other black women writers and teachers are working through those archives and saying their names. Black women's writing is full of such narratives of being disbelieved, but writing continuously anyway. I'm thinking also of the wonderful interviews in Adiola James's Black Women Speak, where now canonical women writers, Buchia Mecheta, Flora Nwapa, and, and Zulu Sofola, Basie Head, and so on, tell James of the horrors of not being reviewed when they first publish, of their manuscripts stolen and published under different people's names, men's, those novels then being circulated, and the original writers not being able to get any injustice, and so forth. And so the specter of disbelief. This is one tradition that necessitates that Black women write, never in excess, because too much is impossible. But there's another tradition in hooks and in black women's writing, one of joy in writing, hooks's rapture. When we see us as black joy, here is the first line of Phyllis Wheatley's 1773 preface to poems on various subjects, religious and moral. This is the very first line of her preface. And I quote her, the following poems were written originally for the amusement of the author, as they were the products of her leisure moments, end of quote. The amusement of the black woman writer, the amusement of the author, and for more than three centuries, the amusement of her readers too. It is true that there are these tradition, traditions enabling ones and ones that attempt to interpret and institutionalize the lie of absence. But we also have this standing testimony of a tradition of black women's writing for sheer pleasure, regarding us with the specific textures of the joy that comes out of writing. And as they world with their words, the, rever the reverberations are planetary and reach across time like the century here represented, not cartographically putting them in place, 
not locking them into categories that are deceptively simple, but pointing to the many textures, artistic choices, and possibilities made possible by Black women's creative and intellectual work, reaching back into the past, expanding possibilities for the present, and into the futures we deserve expanding the ways in which we can engage in expansive, discursive regimes, subscribed to in the place where meaning is made, framed by multiple epistemic words, worlds and words. Thank you so much, Professor Puma. Um... Uh, I give the word now to Kutanai Faile Tuami. Hello, hi. Um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this. Uh, it's very important and um, I'm honored to be part of this. Um, I guess I wanted to start off by highlighting uh, oppositional gaze that comes from the collection of essays, the hooks of the Hook's um, collection of essays that she did in 1992, which is a collection of essays, uh, Black Looks, Black Representation, and the type of looking that was um, involved, that involves the political rebellion and resistance against repression of Black persons, right to look. And it got me thinking um, of, I guess, the right to look and the right to listen, the right to see, coming from a, the perspective of a young girl who was particularly in, particularly interested in the other, and the other could be kind of seen as like I was interested in like um, punk rock. Um, Things that weren't necessarily seen as um, uh, black culture or black uh, belonging, um, and I guess for a long time in my life I had been questioning what is looking and what is the right gaze, and um, you know what 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 should a black child look at growing up? Um, I guess. It, and and it got me thinking of the 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 bell um like it got me thinking of bell hooks and 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 her thinking in relation with art cinema media and um sorry I got everything written down and and um and I guess like with with bell hooks having like lived in segregated America. She would often see certain depictions of black people and how these depictions were often uh, meant to affirm or reaffirm racial dynamics at the time. But with her seeing this, she 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 interrogated and reflected on how these depictions weren't uh, a reflection, a direct reflection of a. Uh, of her upbringing or of her family or her family life. And that this representation only, um, it was a, an idea from someone else. This is, we're talking about um, segregated America. So cinema at the time or TV at the time, you would get a particular person who was representing um, what black meant, what what being black meant, what being African meant, uh, and I guess just like bell hooks for such a long time, um, I hadn't found like the correct representation of myself until I came across uh, a writer and filmmaker, uh, Issa Rae. She has since become global sensation. She's an amazing uh, filmmaker and uh, screenplay writer. And she, at the, at the time when I was growing up, I guess when I was 19, in my late teens, I came across Awkward Black Girl. And I guess I hadn't seen 
any accurate I hadn't seen any accurate uh, representation of my identity until I've seen that. And it kind of, it's the same feeling that I would get if I were to meet, if a Christian was to meet uh, Jesus in a way. I mean, it sounds, I don't want to put her on a pedestal of like, you know, like she's, she's Jesus or anything. Um, but, uh, you know, if you, if you think of it in the, in the perspective of a young Zimbabwean girl who, had inherently just resisted traditional ways of thinking of how a black woman should behave in a patriarchal society. Um, if that hadn't come at a very particular moment in my in my life, I don't know if if I would still be questioning how I should behave, how I sh how one should exist. Um, how one should represent themselves. Um, and I think, I, I guess it's important to have these uh, uh, alternative voices flooding the cultural landscape and uh, in, in whatever shape, form or medium. Um, and this way, I guess you get to influence, but most importantly, validate someone's uh, experience. And I guess when I was uh, when I was in when I was invited to this webinar, the immediate translation of bell hooks uh, was uh, no woman should write, no woman can, no woman, no woman uh, can write, no woman can paint, make film, make music, even think in their private moments enough um, and I guess cultivating uh, individual individual narratives, thoughts or uh, uh, it's just as important as uh, cultivating individual, uh, not individual, but community spaces. You know, you could be a, a mother, a lover or a sister It's not just restricted to writers or or artists, but more uh, the general population. You know, I I often find that my like intellectual platforms should uh, be open to the general general people and. Um, And these uh, talks can also take place through social media discourses. And I think, I think that uh, it's not just important, it's not just as important to create the spaces in, in what we're having now but to expand this idea of thinking, creating um, into our general population, especially of uh, Black women. And I wanted to, I guess I wanted to highlight that and in, because I, of my work really just deals with uh, the alternative thinking pattern. So you're a woman, you have uh, gender dysphoria, you are trying to find yourself in a space, you're trying to find yourself in society um, and you are not uh, confirming to ideas or ideologies. And I think if we expand the, the the if we if everyone can expand, I think people should just flood forward. If you're creative, if you are a Twitter scroll, if you're a Twitter, like, I don't know, whatever you are, you just go forth uh, as a as a as a 
as a black woman or a woman, just go forth and say how you say what you think and how you feel. Uh, and in a sense, you you are partaking in this uh, in this very instance, like in in this uh, on this premise that Bill Hooks has, has kind of like set set forth, which is. just continue on bring it forth um i don't i don't i don't believe in this idea of uh, erasing whatever narrative you have in mind i might have just said a lot of things so i i'll i'll stop here and I'll open up for uh any clarifications in the in the in the next uh i guess uh audience if anyone has questions I'll, I'll i'll stop here thank you thank you so much Kutanai. um uh please uh, now we'll have uh, professor yudekis espinosa minoso uh, professor will be talking in spanish but uh you have the interpretation button below and you can choose to listen in, in Spanish or uh, English. Thank you. Good, good day. I want to start by thanking for the possibility to participate in this webinar. I feel very honored to be able to share to share this space with our beloved Africa, where my ancestors come from also, ancestors who were trafficked up to, to these lands where I'm speaking from to you all. I'm gonna dedicate these words to all the sisters and this colonial legacy, we're trying to, to bring back the memory of who we are and who we were and not to abandon it as it was imposed on us, not to abandon that history of our roots, of our origin. I loved uh, the proposal, the provocative proposal of this webinar, no black woman can write enough. It's a provocative phrase and alluring and inspiring, which our American sister, Bell Hooks, left us. In effect, a lot that we have to say, we have, we have a never ending amount of experiences to speak about these silent worlds where we come from, which we have been annulled and erased by the colonial press. We are in a peak moment right now in the struggle of consciousness to confront racist um, establishments and the museums, universities, institutions, and the publications. There are more presence of racialized people and sp specifically of black women. Despite this, the power still remains in the hands of people that have a European origin, white people. It is still, that's why this is still insufficient, what we have to say. We cannot become tired of speaking and illustrating the world where we come from. It's insufficient because it's a great effort that we have to do every day to be able to say what we need to say and to say it from a place where, where we don't accept what is imposed on us, what we're supposed to say, what is imposed on us from colonialism which is not what we have to say. There is an infinite struggle from our part to write and to represent the world where we come from. And there are very small spaces 
all this struggle that we've been carrying forward, there are very few and small spaces where we can be found or where we are assigned, where we're trying in a loud voice to be heard. The entry conditions to these small spaces, disability spaces, remain in the hands of white people. And the price that we pay is high. In order to be able to participate in these different spaces of the globalized society, we are demanded to adapt to certain criteria and we are evaluated from there. Our capacity to say something, to construct a truth, aesthetics, and to construct narratives regarding the world. Although we have adopted the strategy to learn the language and to keep our own languages, writers have to learn, women writers have to learn what are the channels which where they can speak uh, their own words. It is also true that we are suffering the risk to project these, these words under norms, and we cannot lose ourselves in, that, in the way, in the path. If so, we can lose a precious world created by our, by our ancestors, and we have the responsibility to keep it. There is also a writing. We must not forget the writing, um, black faces, white masks. Uh, we, we were also warned that the masters works, never destroyed the master's works. And it re re reminds that uh, the white master can live within us. So this implicates a struggle that is outwards, but also one that is inwards. How can we, against all of this that we are facing, we can build our own narrative, our own history, and to not erase what we were and what we are. This means also that while we, uh, if we don't change the criteria, we will not win the struggle against what has been on, imposed on us. This implicates to understand that the discourse to open the doors of state institutions, of the market, of academics, universities, museums, in the field of literature and the field of publishing to say where we could be heard, it implicates for black people, it's specifically a, a battlefield it implicates that we mustn't lose ourselves in rhetoric, in the rhetorics that these spaces sustain, and that we have to insist and keep insisting and insisting and insisting on how to able to negotiate that that entry not implicate erasing or annulling what we are, where we came from, what we have inherited from our ancestors, so that we don't have to sacrifice ourselves when we enter a space, a mobility or visibility of space, our worlds need to be recreated. And that's what we are doing. We need to find the way to recreate those worlds and those worlds where we come from to be lit and to be understood, even with a language that often is not seen as a language that is appropriate, a language that is not appropriate. That's why we have to play between learning the master's language and also not losing our own language. In the the black women writer has not hasn't been written enough because we're swimming against a current. It's a it's a swim against current which and Nick has annihilated, which erases our representation. The uh, colonial system needed uh, justifications for the master's work this implemented idea of superiority amongst those that colonized us, that enslaved us. And that meant to locate this, this narratives of these colonialists with the other, on top of the other narratives that our peoples had and that our people have kept building us. And this has implicated, there was implication that a narrative was universalized which depicted the construction of a hierarchy and that what we said, what our narrative said, and what we had to say from the point of view of our experiences had no validity. We had to swim against all of that, against that entire colonial history. We are writing against all of that. Why? Because we need to persist, because we continue just as our ancestors, we keep resisting these attempts to erase and to kill 
our history, our roots, uh, the cultures where we came from. We need to understand that that narrative constructed by the West has an epistemic material and aesthetic consequence that are conveyed in the coloniality of power. There is a representation of black women and of our communities that has played a fundamental role in this process of exploitation of the worlds where we come from. As an Afro-Colombian writer states, she was also a painter, there is a chromatic of coloniality, as there also is a chromatic of the narrative. There is a coloniality of the narrative and of the point of view of the perspective, which places its seal on the construction of the criteria and what is seen as what is a good writing, a good uh, essay, or what is considered to be aesthetic or not. Against all of this, we need to write. That's why never what we write will be enough. The people, the col colonialized people, we have been seen and we keep being considered as being unable to produce symbolic works of art since this has been defined with certain standards which are considered universal, which are characteristics from colonialization, what they call to be art, to be aesthetic and a capacity to build a narrative on the world. The creative act by excellence has been added exclusively to that which has been considered human over the rest of the species and over the peoples of the world. There is an aesthetic which was considered which was self-confided, the capacity of a superior aesthetic. And it's against that that we are writing, that we are producing other types of aesthetics, other types of imaginations, the narratives, structural and aesthetics uh, works. They swim against every structure that has been created. In what way of these criteria are we reviewing these criteria? We are eroding them. In what way our entry to the cultural production spaces is confronting these narratives and all these criteria to which evaluate what is a good work of art or work of literature? To finish this, conclude this intervention, I would like to remember what is my own history and which is the history of many sisters who are writing, who are producing visual aesthetic arts in a different art in this continent, which was called America by the colonialists, but what we call under its original name, Avellana. It's from my experience, I got to writing to literature because I had a need to say more or over what was said to me. I felt the need to build a history against the history which was being imposed on me. A need to analyze the world and to think in a different way from what I could find in the theories and in the analyses or studies which I found or were being taught to me through a formal education, the educational system, or in the university, I began writing because also within the social movements in which I participated in, I did not find something that referred to my own personal experience. I could not find that my words were being represented or my voice was being heard. The world that I knew through, through my life experience in my community, the community where I come from, it was not being spoken about the colonial wounds which I had within me, which my body had, and also the majority of the sisters and comrades who live in this colonial, colonized land, colonized by Europe and subsequently by the United States. So I think I began my own work. It's a work which also swims against or goes against this erasure of our capacity to produce aesthetically and to produce thought. 
it's a necessity that we've had so we could stand up and make our voices heard and we i have been finding through time the right pathways that allowed me to narrate my experience and the world where i come from and to write and speak about what we have to say on top of everything and the history that the west has built but there are a lot of comrades which are doing the same work. And some of them I'm thinking about, for example, in the work of Concepcion Evaristo, who thinks about uh, escribidencia, escribidencia, that relationship between writing, what is our experience as Afro-descendant women in this wounded continent? What does it mean to write and to return, to, to reconstruct our history, a history a history which has been, which a lot of it has been forgotten because our ancestors were trafficked, which were brought over in ships and which were subjected to slavery. But also those histories of resistance, which we have had because we haven't only been what we have been imposed or what they did with us. We have resisted, we have been warriors. We have emulated the African warriors that also confronted this colonialist process. And we have had to reconstruct our history. We are still in that process. And therefore it will never be enough. Everything that we have to say against this narrative, against this monster who writes a history, a fictitious history about us, a fictitious history, which what does is erase, annul our capacity as human beings with the capacity to think and to recreate and analyze the world. There are marvelous writers like Rodriguez, like Delaya, who are working on aesthetics that include the spirituality that we inherited from Africa, which have been fundamental in our continent through video art, uh, through different expositions, the work of Johannes Gomez, or through experimental video art or in film where they they show infinite portraits and stories histories and they're recreating the caribbean from our points of view so in poetas y novelistas como como mayra santos febres por ejemplo santos terres for example or Achantidina Orozco, or the work of singer songwriters like Fortuna, or dancers like Ayardo, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of things that we are doing and it will never be enough. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for these three great um, presentations. Uh, can we all turn on our cameras, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, I will start with the round of questions and then we'll open for everyone. We already have a question on the Q&A, but um, um, I, I would like to start with Professor Pumla. Um, uh, you talked about archive and tradition. And um, uh, I, I, I was thinking, who are we talking to when we write? Uh, because I understand that, uh, this canon you refer to as uh, it's, not, it's not our own creation, that canon. But for instance, when you mention the self-amusement, there's a specific audience with whom we want to share these uh, moments. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you so much. Yes, I mean, I don't think that there's one archive and I don't think there's one set of audiences, but I think that historically some audiences have been dominant and more recognized as, as <clears throat> excuse me, as audiences. I think that one of the things we learn from, kind of, at least in English, one of the things we learn from kind of black women's writing in English is that 
it it create it always it, it always creates more than what is assumed to be possible at the moment of inception, right? So I think the archives are definitely the white supremacist gaze, or as Mina um, Salami calls it, the Europatriarchal gaze, right? So that's the assumed audience. But I think that historically we see that books find audiences that are, that they're not supposed to find, right? And so black women. Black women are always also other Black women's audiences, right? And so, but but I think like um, like like uh, Yuda Kiss said, one of the things that we sorry, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we that we that that we that we so, so there are these multiple traditions, right? Um, and there are multiple archives, and there is a way in which certain kinds of interpretations are privileged over others, right? But I don't think the archive ever at any point excludes other Black women writers. I think that because Black women writers have historically themselves not been valued, we, the Black women writers, Black women readers have also been undervalued. And so who the audience is, the audience is, we have the same audiences that everybody has, but we also, I mean, a Black women also have each other as, 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 as audiences. And I, I, I tried in the second, so I tried to kind of talk to these two audiences because Paula Gunn Allen really does that. She talks about the audience that you inherit. And sometimes it's black women, right? So that have these ideas. So this is what you did was kind of so powerfully articulated, right? So this idea that people can be black women in body, but still approach the text because we all socialized in the world that we socialized in. And so just because I'm a black woman doesn't mean that I'm the ideal black woman reader, whatever that looks like, right? So I may still receive the text and may have the same assumptions and be so, um, successfully socialized into hegemonic ways of making sense of the text. So I think that reader is always possible. But I, 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 I think with Hooks and I think with Gun Allen and I think with Musila, some of the feminists that I that I evoked, that there's always this other audience that 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 that's possible, right? And 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 that and that audience is not just possible as a reader, but part of what Black women's writing does, as someone like Barbara Boswell would argue, is that it creates the possibility of other Black women's writing, right? So it creates Black women's writing also creates other Black women writers in addition to, 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 to readers. So I think that all of those audiences are, are Black women's audiences. Thank you so much. I was particularly thinking about what Kuzanai shared with us uh, about her reaction to Issa Rae. Uh, um, it was a great writer for me to find as well. Uh, uh, but uh, when uh, what I see here uh, on, on what Kutanai said was I, I, I see this experience, the recognition of her own experience. Uh, uh, but uh, and, and we have a question on the chat that asks about that. So I, 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 can you talk a little bit about the difference of being an African? Black woman, the specificities of uh, of the experience of an African woman, uh, because there are differences to the diasporic experience. Uh, yeah, would you please start, Pumla, and then Kutsanai? Would you mind to follow up on that? And you, the kids, as well, because I also think you uh, uh, touch into that in your presentation. I think there are geographic differences, but I think there are generational differences as well. Right. I mean, if we look at the scholarship on black women's writing, if we look at someone like um, Carol Boyce Davis, she's able to trace in different epochs commonalities in Latin American women, black women writing, um, North American black women writing, Afro P, what we would today call Afro P N, but black women writing in different places in Europe and continental women. And so I think some of the, if just like we think about the politics of the black world traveling quite significantly, we actually see significant. Um, connections and similarities with different generations. And so, I mean, you know, so if you, so, 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 so for example, it's not like Audre Lorde was talking to, um, uh, uh, um, really my brain. Um, 
Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll reference someone else then. Audre Lord was talking to, 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 to Ama Ata Aidu, was talking to Miriam Tladi, right? So, I mean, there's an enormous wealth of work in the 40, in the, from, the, from, the, from the 60s, from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s of Black women talking from different parts of the, of the African world as writers. And this, we actually have this enormous archive. And so I think that what often happened, which is not to say that people have the same experiences, but I don't think that people have the same experience even on the same continent, right? I don't think necessarily Black Canadian women have the same experience as Black Mexican women writers, right? And so it's like even on the same continent, like North American, and I know often when we say North America, we pretend Mexico is not part of North America, we think Canada and the US. But you know, if there's significant differences there, there are big differences between a woman in Chad and a woman in Morocco and a woman in Zimbabwe, right? So, but I do think that there are similarities, of course. Um, and I think that time also, I think the phase, the political era makes a difference. I think that they are, um, and I think it's really important, and I don't think anyone of us are doing it here, and I certainly think the exhibition doesn't do it um, from the little that I've seen, um, that we not kind of fix and homogenize. This is an African continental experience because it's a very diverse continent. And my experience as, a, as an older uh, African woman, even as an older Southern African woman, might be very different from Kuzanai, who's a young, I, I'm just saying, I'm not being aged. I'm just giving an example as a, as a younger Southern African woman, right? So, of kind of how you come to feminism, where you see yourself, where you look to things. But I think that I, I like to think of it in terms of possibilities. Um, that I mean, the the, the 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 limitations absolutely and the difficulties, but absolutely the 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 the, the similarities. But I think what resonated for me, many of the things, but what if that's relevant here in what Kuta and I was saying was in that what it what it what happens when you recognize yourself in someone else's and in, in, in a, another black woman's right another black woman's writing, and she doesn't have to be exactly like you in order for you to 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 recognize yourself. But we all know that value. I remember the first black time I read a, 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 the first time I read an essay by a black woman. I remember the first time I read a book by a black woman. Um, and those were really informed, and it was, she was feminist, and it was, it was a, and she wasn't South African, because all the South African ones were bad, right? And so it doesn't have to, but the recognition is possible, because it's imaginative as well, it's an imaginative connection, it doesn't have to be like a flattened, you know, we're talking about um, creativity as, as, as well, and the possibilities of, of reading across difference are, I think, have certainly for me, um, in my own biography, but also in kind of the, in teaching, have been quite useful in reading kind of the the, 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 the works of black women um, writing in different languages across 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 time and across across the globe. I didn't want to say yeah across the globe. I'll say the globe. Good tonight. Yeah, I would, I would add to what Pumla is saying about uh, that it doesn't necessarily have to be someone that looks like, maybe not, yeah, it doesn't have to be like a Black woman that resembles like your entire gene, genealogy, like you don't have to be this person who, uh, I kind of, I, I, in my experiences is that I've, I've come to recognize the people that resonate with me. So I start off with my own narrative and my own uh, interests. And then I find these individuals in society, in, in global society that resonates with me. So, I mean, we could look at, because I'm into pop culture. So we could look at like young, young people like Willow Smith, for instance, like how, like she's a phenomenon, she's amazing I, I love her and she's this young woman who is who is introducing this idea of polyamory um this in, like all sorts of like different ways of being that you would not necessarily find I would never find someone maybe I would I just haven't yet but I would never find someone like that in um in Zimbabwe um and then 
I guess uh, with media and TV, reality TV. <laughs> so I've been watching a lot of reality TV, in, in, in South African reality TV, because they show Max. Uh, this is a it's like Netflix, but for South African, and you can uh, you can watch all programs. And this new program that is talking about. Um, um, uh, it's not a new program, but it's it's been there. It's uh, polygamy, and it's speaking about. Uh, I might not be talking about what we're talking about now, but I'm just want to to kind of like uh, include this because I think it's important. But women that would get into polygamy relationships, and uh, and that's an African experience. And it's good to see that. And it's good to see, it's good to see like women that kind of accept it and they're kind of like, yes, I want to get into this. Uh, and maybe it's more, you know, my methodology is more um, auto-ethnographic. And so I am always seeking resonance. And I'm always seeking what is what applies to my life? What would I accept? Um, how would I navigate this world? And uh, it doesn't have to come from my own uh, people, Shona people. The dialogue is endless and it's uh, spread across continents and it's spread across um, generations as well. But I think I've forgotten what Susanna was. <laughs> the first the question was. I think I'm just now riffing off uh, Pumla. <laughs> no, no, I think you 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 got it perfectly. Yes, okay. thank you. <laughs> you, dear kiss, I think you were also talking about that when you talk about the self narration and 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 the sharing of uh, experiences among different um, either writing or dance or other media. Yeah, I, I I believe like it, it's, it's it's important. I see. Pardon. Okay. Go on. Go on. Hablo entonces. Okay. Perdón. Yo creo. Can I go ahead? Sorry. Sorry if I interrupted. If you want to finish your idea, you can go ahead. Oh, it's all right. Okay. Um, sí, muy interesante toda la yes, the conversation has been very interesting. Um, there is an author, a female author, regarding these new generations. I'm also, I also have um, some years on me, but there, are, so there definitely are some differences amongst generations regarding politics as well. I'm completely in agreement that we are not. Uh, one, just one thing, although there is a unity in historical aspects which unifies us in the roots, it's what, what happens since that tragic moment where Africa and this continent where I'm speaking from, we were intervened. It was two continents that were intervened and there is a, a colonialist measure there which constitutes um, in experience, in terms of experiences, which is, which has constituted, which has a common matrix, a common pattern from where we can build our subjectivities and how we can know about ourselves and learn about ourselves historically. So if effectively, there is a unity, there is a common ground, but at the same time, each people and within each people, there are different histories, different stories, also uh, per individual, and also the way that we answer and the way that we try to deal with this historical wound, this colonial wound. So in regards to the question that you made to me, which some of the someone from the audience has made uh, want to remind to remember that to remind that there's a new generation within the critical studies critical race uh, theory studies which appeared recently in the US and there is a black female author a black feminist who 
comes from the critical race theory, who's called uh, Arnold, and she speaks about a concept which is quite interesting to me. Despite the way that she that I propose, I propose to work it work with with different. She speaks about the concept of critical um, storytelling. She speaks about critical storytelling as a methodology that has to do with rebuilding the archives and the violence that can be found in the official archives where the silence is turned as part of the colonial legacy that we have because our histories our stories as people that come from the slave trafficking and human trafficking the violence that constitutes that constitutes us subjectively has been silenced for a very long time that is true on one side um, it's also true that we have tried to reconstruct through the archives and through um, fiction and nonfiction when that history has been looked at again from our own eyes there is also a tendency just in the aesthetic uh, arts, such as literature, to reproduce a perspective from the wound, from the injury, which is what, that's why it's proposed to review the archives, to reconstruct the voices which are silenced by the archives and also the violence. In my own work, let's say in the works that, in the projects, in which I am committed to when I'm working in, I tend to think that that critical storytelling must not remain only in the reconstruction of violence. Because when we reconstruct that history, only from the point of view of violence, we could also be contributing to this fiction which has been built upon us and on our peoples, how people could not be historical agents and who are, are also capable that they have the capacity to produce a world, to produce feminicity, aesthetics, which counter narratives that confront those that want to erase us. So that's why it's interesting to me and I'm, I'm involved in several projects, research projects, but also which are arts uh, creation and literature projects. What interests me is, is to focus, and I think this is very important, on the way in which we can see ourselves historically and we can build or rebuild, reconstruct that archive, empowering by empowering our peoples and our subjectivities as historicals, subjects who were capable to confront colonialization, a history that returns our dignity to being beings and subjects which who are not only a product of submission, but also of our own capacity to produce a world and our feelings, our sensations, which I believe they can be different types of art and different, many different ways. And it can also be in terms of the lineal temporality, which confronts the lineal historical, and which also confronts everything from a point of view of spirituality, which is based on holding on to and hearing our ancestors, listening to our ancestors who speak to us and the stories that tell us how did they created worlds, worlds of happiness, despite and against that, what that pretended to erase us and to disappear us. So therefore, for me, this work is this story, critical storytelling work is very important. And also to allow to depict not only the injuries that are produced from the violence through the archives, but also to show to see that that silence 
in the archives is systematically hiding the way in which our peoples have been able to survive all this by providing examples of how we can continuously reconstruct to start over again and always start over again by bringing back the memories. A memory which shouldn't be forgotten, but we, we have it in our own bodies, in our own behavior, in our ancestors, the spirituality which we have inherited from them. And I think that there is, there it can be found as this other writer mentioned, I forget her name right now. Well, there's another American author. She says that the secret of resistance is in our capacity to recreate life in another way. And the happiness can keep the secret of resistance. I think our peoples have resisted thanks to that ca infinite capacity that we've had to recreate the world. Wallace World, thank you very much. We've always had this ability to recreate the world despite everything that, everything that has tried to erase us and annul us and disappear us. And I also wanna put this on the table. Pumla, I saw you nodding with your head. Do you want to follow up on that? No? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really like this concept from Hartman of critical fabulation. And um, and I agree with you with, that we shouldn't focus on uh, violence alone. But uh, I also struggle with the resistance in the sense that we are also just normal human beings. And sometimes we fail and sometimes we just cry and get hurt and and lose and it's uh, and suffer. And 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 uh, I, I I feel that as a black woman, sometimes I'm I'm caught between being resistant and strong and being the victim. And uh, and 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 I think that it's something that it's really against ourselves in this sense. And, and, and for instance, when I think about who are we talking to, because I, I think that these two opposite, uh, um, it is as if we're talking to the colonial days. It's not that we're talking amongst ourselves. For instance, who are we telling the, the stories of our ancestors and of these, dreams that we have and we believe and these kind of things that we know that happens in that happen in our families and we talk with our siblings and we're not I feel that sometimes we fail to share those stories and this is just normal life it's not about being strong it's just about everyday experience and and when I think about the work of Bell Hooks, I, I think that it's important to write nonfiction. I think everything is essential. We, we need to take the space. But I also feel that there's a, a space of showing ourselves as human, uh, of people who love, people who suffer. And, and, and I think we have a long way for that. Uh, we have to start writing about our own experiences uh, rather than allow people. For instance, we have numbers. We have numbers about uh, kids that die before the age of five. We have all the numbers, we, but we don't have the, the stories of these numbers. I mean, I think we do. I think that um, there's a long history of certain books in the, even on the continent, in the African women's literary, even just cannot, books that are canonical now, if you look at how they were received when they came out, they were speaking about the unspeakable. And I think that, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, I wonder <clears throat> whether this pressure, well, I don't wonder, I have a view. So let me just pretend, not pretend that I suspect, because I think I know the answer. Uh, it, it, I think one of the problems with um, 
black women, but black men's literature as, as well, certainly in Southern Africa, is that for a long time, the problem wasn't with the literature, but the interpretation overvalued ideas of resistance. And so no matter what a person is doing, a person has characters that are playing and doing crazy things that don't make sense, that are just delicious and mysterious and, and, and they, you know, but, but then, the, then, the, then the scholarship for a long time would say, protest. Oh, here's the, pro and, you, and sometimes you look at the, it's a love story. Nobody's protesting. You literally sometimes this, you know, it's just, I think that when we're talking about, <clears throat> when we're talking, when I was trying to talk earlier, talking earlier on about some of these archives that we, and the things that walk into the room ahead of us, some of them have to do with the fact that people already, there's, there are established registers of reading black women's writing that people they say okay so Susanna Sousa wrote the book ah black woman okay so this is the interpretative lens I'm going to look for resistance I'm going to look for difficulty I'm going to look for blood I'm going to look for pain it could be a novel about discovery and play and sexual experimentation and causing nonsense but people are going to write someone yeah. is going to write yeah, some story experimentation yes. and funny things but 99 percent of the people are going to say resistance historical resistance black woman trope she is writing against the black woman trope and you're like well maybe but she's also writing for something what is the thing what is the thing that she's writing there's no black woman trope okay there's a black woman trope and maybe you see this character that is like nothing you've seen that you imagine exists in a novel by someone like Susanna Souza instead of looking at what the novel does and what Susa produces, you come and you're like, she's resisting. And maybe she isn't resisting. Maybe she's actually doing something completely different if you pay attention to the novel, instead of assuming by virtue of her being a black woman, that must be what her books are all going to be about. So I'm going to look for resistance. And maybe she's a serial killer, right? Maybe she's a serial killer who, I don't know, but you don't even see that you say, oh, you see, it's the rage at the colonial system. Well, maybe she's just a crazy, destructive black woman, which is fine, right? We can write about those too, but you can't because even if you write it, the most, the, the received ideas about how to respond. And so I think that, no, I don't think I know that in this region, especially, there is such a passionate commitment to a weird thing called protest, that no matter how different black writers are, they are protesting, like from a certain era. And you look at the writers, these writers stylistically, content-wise, they're all black women or black men. Nothing is similar in their work, except the fact that their characters are black, but they're all protesting. Well, no. Sometimes the problem is not with the literature that people are producing, because we have so much rich, troublemaking, bizarre, wonderful, terrible, whatever literature on this on this on this continent. But the the criticism is 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 the problem very often. So it's like we can't women black women only write about pain and resistance. Well, I mean, no, we don't because that's not all we think about. And most of the time, when we sit, like you know, this whole conversation, we haven't been talking about resistance and difficulty. And but supposedly we can only write about that in fiction. Uh, no. <laughs> you were saying something good tonight. No, I was just like on this tangent. I was like, yes, <laughs> this is. I apologize. I, I apologize for like cutting in. But I was like, yes, I need to voice my. I agree. I agree. And I I kind of say it in in art as well. It's that I'm a black woman. Well, what else do you expect me to paint? I'm <laughs> I'm around black people. I'm around my Zimbabwe, my Zimbabwe culture. I'm around uh, most of my friends are black, even in England, right? So this is what I'll paint. This is the realities I'll paint. These are the topics I will take on. However, when I do take on take on those topics, they are kind of seen as yes you are you're making you work we're making work of resistance like you you're making a political statement no these are human beings we're all human beings 
and I've always I've often been so envious of like my 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 white art other white artists that I was in at Wimbledon or the Ruskinette uh when I was studying is that they could paint flowers and those flowers could just mean flowers <laughs> and those flowers could just mean um but if you plant flowers are you playing you painting land no yeah exactly I'm like what the you know what I mean? <laughs> what the fuck? What's going on? You know, I, I, there is no freedom to just be. And I think the conversation has to kind of tilt towards that. I feel like true freedom is making work as an artist, as a creative, as a writer, as a filmmaker, whatever you are doing, right? Music wise. You're making work and you are making work and you just happen to embody this black body. I hate this term black body, but you you are, um, I think I'm a black human. Black body just sounds like I'm a body, just I'm a dead person. That's how I view this term. But I'm a, you are a black human being living on this planet and you are taking in information from all different directions and you happen to make a work and that is valid. And it's, it doesn't have to, it doesn't always have to um, confirm to this idea of like being a, you don't always have to <laughs> be in resistance of something. That is important. And there, I feel like there's other, there are other artists or creatives or thinkers that directly confront these notions but we don't not everyone is like this and 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 it's a kind of like a subtle racism i'll stop here <laughs> i totally agree with you i i also think it's a way to contain uh black humans you know uh, we have a question on the chat, but I think we just answered from Eve Thompson about uh, other things other from racism, but I think we all uh, end up talking about that, but I don't know if anyone wants to directly address. Uh, she says that um, her observation of African experiences suggests that there are strong patriarchy that exists apart from racial domination. And she uh, gives the example of the recent law that was passed in Uganda against um, homosexuality. Yeah, I don't know if you want to talk to that. I mean, I, I think those pressures exist everywhere. I think all societies are patriarchal. I think that you are able sometimes to recognize um, patriarchies that are slightly different from the ones you used to much quicker because it's like it's the water temperature is slightly different. But I don't, I don't actually think that, first of all, I don't think that you can, I don't, I don't know that we can say the same thing across the continent, number one. Number two, I think that if we, if, if we, if I move from the premise that <clears throat> these are all patriarchal societies, then it's, it's things are just going to express themselves differently. But I don't think that, and I think that the presence of race and how race interlocks with, with, um, with patriarchy in different African contexts has, some, has a lot to do, the particular ways it does, has a lot to do with whether you're talking about parts of the continent that were settler colonies or parts of the continent that were not settler colonies. And so I don't think that you can expect, so for example, yeah, so I don't, I think that there are many similarities between um, patriarchy in, in Southern Africa and East Africa. That has, that is a function, not of Southern Africa and East Africa, it's a function of similarities in history um, as, 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 as well, right? Or which, which, who was, who we were colonized by. Um, so yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that, I don't, I don't know that I agree that there's, um, excuse me, I don't, I don't think I agree that there's, there's that, that patriarch, I mean, I, but this is an, this is an ongoing discussion, I think, even among African feminists, but I think that what, what we, the, 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 the bigness of race and of the relationship between race and gender is going to depend on which part of the continent um, 
you are because some of us feel it much more immediately for historical reasons, whereas other people, it's always there, but it's not as present because the history is not exactly um, the same, but I don't think it's ever upset. Thank you. We have another question um, uh, by Chenning Bae on um, opportunities for the different ways of writing, maybe taking the term in a less literal way. So to tell stories in the countryside and some of the urban neighborhoods where books may not always be the most relevant social currency. Um, I'm sure there are experiences uh, everywhere. Uh, uh, in Angola, for instance, we have a lot of spoken word events. It's a huge thing. Theater is also very big. Uh, and most of the um, theater companies, uh, they write uh, they, they write local stories and local about local experiences they're not doing international canonical books, but I'm sure Kutsanai, Bumla, Yudekis, you can also share your experiences. Yeah. Let's maybe start with Yudekis. Um, I, I didn't understand the question fully, please. Could you please repeat the question? Chat. It's um, uh, so Jenny is asking about other uh, different ways of writing, uh, um, uh, ways to tell stories in the countryside and also in urban neighborhoods where books yeah. may not be as available. Yes, it's uh, it's also important because often many of of the cultures that have survived the slavery processes in Aviala and in the Caribbean, specifically where I'm speaking from, they are not cultures who had a written language. They're mostly oral uh, cultures. I come from a family which has an oral tradition. I am the only one in my family, in fact, that has uh, learned to write. I don't come from an experience where the world, the recreation of the world or the thinking of the world necessarily has to be placed on a page, on the written page, but that it's transmitted or it's transferred through stories, through songs, through music, through body language, body expression. There is a teacher that's called Maria Mayarco from Dominican Republic, who says that Caribbean memory is kept in the body, in our bodies, where we keep our memories that is here that through our expressions, we have been able to keep, to hold the stories, stories of, of happiness, but also of violence, of sadness, and also of resistance. And I did not uh, focus on this question that you have just asked me, Susana, because I, I kept thinking about uh, Pumla's uh, comments and, and Violet's comments on the question of violence on the issue. When I express myself uh, on violence, I'm not thinking about someone that's holding a weapon or a gun or someone who is using uh, writing or the words to, to confront through a combative discourse, something that is tried to be erased. I'm thinking about the short history stories, uh, the little daily actions that we do, which boycotts that state of suffering, of violence, of intention to disappear us. I don't think we are in disagreement because in reality, what I'm effectively appealing to there is to widen that concept of resistance, to amplify it, that in the social movement and history, who always thinks that we're always holding a rifle or a weapon in our hands, 
um, thinking exactly that our peoples have been have resisted through time that because although everything has been negated to us, everything has been constructed to negate us of what we have to be, who we have to be, despite all of this, people I'm, I'm thinking of many of the examples that you provided. Many people can contemplate, even can think about a flower, can look at a flower, and they can find that in that image of a flower, but you can turn it into a song, a happy song, and that you sing while you're working the land, and or that it's carried on to a ritual with your community, to find yourself with the others and to dream about the world and enjoy the world and enjoy of your existence. That is a resistance itself against everything that wants to erase us and all this. I don't think that we are always with a rifle in our hands, but that, that we are recreating and making life possible. And that making life possible without even thinking about necessarily a conscience that I'm doing this because they're trying to erase me. But you, we do this from the freedom to be a living a being that lives with other uh, living beings. And you make of that life something that's possible, that's livable. That in itself, without enunciating it, it's already confronting those and that which tries to erase you disappear you. Not necessarily there has to be a discourse, a rational discourse on that you are confronting capitalism or you're fighting racism or that you're fighting the patriarchy. The women in our communities are all the time looking at how they are enjoying power, in what way they can make their lives more livable, a better life than what it's pretended how their life should be. How can I say they can do it while, you know, preparing food, cooking, or enjoying time with their children, or dancing with a music that can come from here or from there. It can be pop music that they, they hear on the radio. And from there, that dynamic of persisting with a life, with the capacity to enjoy life, that by itself, it's an it's a it's an action against everything that tries to uh, to erase us, to negate us. And I think all of that, uh, Violet, can also be found in the artists, in the black artists, that say, "This is this is what I want to create." Moreover. In and with art in this, in, in, in you know, in the academies that I'm working in, that's one of the ways in which you have not actually dealt with black creativity as well at all, is to call it protest, to call it resistance. And then once you've said that, you've cataloged it, but you'd never actually analyze it. So you don't know, maybe it's protesting, maybe it's, maybe it's not even good, but you don't even go there to see whether it's interesting. You're just like, so that's what I was, <laughs> so that's why I was resisting it so much. Because I'm like, oh, that's the word here, but not generally. No, but I agree with you in, in terms of the broader arguments. Thank you so much. Good night. If you could please, uh, if you could please uh, repeat the question. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I was on mute. Now we're going to final thoughts. So please share your thoughts on what we've been discussing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I always look out for. I'm a big believer of um, coming back to the earth after death, so reincarnation. And I always believe that you know you have a passion. You have a you you are a black human. I believe that you come back as a as the same as the same person that you were born. Not maybe the same person, but the same tribe, ancestors. It all goes back to that uh, spiritual realm. Um, and so, if he, if if one is dictated by this uh, idea that you come back as the same ancestor, you, you should build up. Uh, 
the interest or, or, or institutions that provide for the many diversities that are within the Black uh, identity. We have Black identity, we have, we have African, I'll, I'll just stick to African identity. So we have Black African identity and then it spreads out to different various uh, formations. And I always go back to obviously my own experiences, which is uh, them, all sorts of things that have been restricted to just being Black um, experiences. So as a, when I make work, when I make paintings, when I'm, when I'm creating um, these narratives, I am speaking to that one person, it could be just one person, that view the world the way that I view and that I have the platform, so why not? I should be true to that. In as much as um, I'm always, in as much as one is always forced to kind of like confirm to this idea that you should make work that is against resistance, um, that is against colonialism. I believe that people that are much better to do that and they will find themselves in those spaces. Y que se encuentran en eso. Uh, the way I work is that I want to work, make work that I closely identify with or ideas that I closely identify with and someone will find it. And I know that that, that one person is this one black girl who's, who's 15, who is uh, 13, who needed that message at that right, who needs that message at the right time. And they might find it in my paintings. And that's what I want to make. I want to make work that reflects that. It doesn't have to be a black girl. It doesn't have to be a, uh, it could be a black uh, boy as well. And that's that's where I stand. And that's where, uh, I guess, when, when we're talking about bell hooks and every woman should write, um, no woman should be, uh, should be afraid to write and should they should go forth and continue on. It is, this mission is, it's very important. It's like, if you have a passion, if you have a fucking like, sorry, I'm saying the F word. If you have, if you have the, the drive to create and you are embodying a black body, then you should, a black human, if you're a black human, just, just do what you need to do in your authentic self and um, continue on. And there will be what that one person, that will be validated. And that's why I brought in the Issa Rae. I feel like if she hadn't done what she did, who knows? Anyway, we can we cannot say we cannot we cannot argue on uh, we cannot like uh, think uh, about what should have would have. But all I want to say is that I'm grateful for those for for her to have existed. I'm great, I'm grateful for Lynette. Uh, Yadomo Boyake, who's a, an amazing painter, who showed me that I could make black portraiture and that it's fine. And you can make it in a way that is speaking of your own, your, your ideal truth, your, the, from the perspective of the world that you're living in. And you don't necessarily have to dive deep into political think. Um, or in this idea of resistance, or you can just make you are black. Your work is in your work is enough. It doesn't have to resist anything. Just just create. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kusanai. That was really beautiful what you just said. <laughs> And uh, thank you so much uh, to the three of you. I think we had a great panel. I'm very, very happy to be part of it. And um, and I think we'll close here on a great note. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. We're still here. Thank you so much, Yurikis, Pumla, Kudzanai, and Susanna, for such an engaging and thought-provoking session. 
Tonight's webinar will be available on Zeitzmacher's YouTube channel in the next few days. Our next webinar will take place on Tuesday, 27 June, and will be titled Fabulation and Figuration, Navigating the Tension Between Image and Imaginaries. So be sure to look out for it on all of our Zeitzmacher social media channels. Thank you all for watching. Take care. Thank you.